A Popular History of Jesuit Spirituality From Early Times to the Present The core of Jesuit spirituality is found in that little handbook, The Spiritual Exercises. It describes the journey of the soul to God, based on Ignatius's own experiences and on the insights he received in prayer. The methodology of the exercises is one of gradual self-purification, leading one to make a decision for Christ. This is why Ignatian spirituality has sometimes been called a spirituality for decision-makers. Ignatius leads the candidate to choose to serve Christ poor and suffering and to enter into companionship with him not just occasionally but as a commitment for life. Underlying it all is the appeal to generosity. What more can I do for Christ? After a prolonged meditation on the life of Christ in the Gospels, the candidate is expected to be able to contemplate the risen Christ at work in the world and in creation. There is a great emphasis on the emotions in Ignatius's methods. He called it movements of the spirit or affectivity, believing that this is how God reveals himself to us. This is why the rules to help discern the spirits is an important contribution of Ignatius to spiritual guidance. Another important contribution is the role of the guide or director. Someone who can rein in impulsiveness or excess, challenge the complacent and help interpret what is happening to the soul at prayer. Yet another important legacy of Ignatius is practical, effective love. Love expressed in doing things, not just in talking or in pleasant feelings. Throughout history, Jesuits have always been known for getting things done. So to sum up, from its very origins, Jesuit spirituality has been a spirituality of companionship with Jesus, the very name of the order, known for its practical approach to prayer and work, and for its spiritual sensitivity to matters of the heart. Give me any day a perceptive spiritual director over a prayerful one, said St. Teresa of Avila. When she was greatly confused in soul, God sent her first Francis Borgia and then the young Jesuit Balthazar Alvarez, who was barely 25 when they first met. He guided her for seven years. What the Jesuits brought to the post-Tridentine church from 1565 onwards, was refreshingly new in many ways. Their first innovation was spiritual guidance for both clergy and laity through leading them to make the exercises. Remember that the Protestants had insisted that God speaks directly to the soul without the intermediary of the church. Ignatius modified this approach by placing a skilled director to help the seeker discern the spirits, the better to understand what God was saying. All the first Jesuits were skilled retreat directors, giving retreats in various forms. 
Peter Faber was one of the best. The second innovation was their abundant use of scripture as distinct from the earlier approach which was excessively moralistic. Do's and don'ts threatening the Christian with hellfire. Yet another innovation of the Jesuits was the catechism. Frequently asked questions on matters of faith and morals neatly printed in a small book the result of the new print technology handy and accessible in cases of doubt. Peter Canisius and Robert Bellamin were the great innovators. Nor did the society shun the role of popular devotions in building the prayer life of the faithful. There were three devotions particularly on which the Jesuits left their mark. The first, the devotion to the Blessed Mother through the Sodality movement. Sodalities were groups of young laymen who followed the Jesuit way of life adapted to their specific circumstances. These young people committed themselves to frequent Mass and Communion, to recite the little office of Our Lady, a prayer in common, and to take up regular work with the poor. As a form of catechesis, it has rarely been rivaled. The communities of Christian life, its modern form, are an excellent spiritual training program for today's laity. Wherever they set up parishes, Jesuits encouraged the devotion to the Eucharist and its frequent reception. Remember that for most Catholics, communion was received just once or twice a year. But the devotion which left its greatest impact upon the post-Tridentine Church was the Jesuit-sponsored devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It grew out of the apparitions of Jesus to the visitation nun Margaret Mary Alacoc in 17th century France and opened ordinary Catholics to the personal love of Jesus as found in the Gospels. Calvinism and Jansenism had created a mindset of fear and pessimism among many. French Jesuits especially, through their writings and spiritual direction, encouraged consecration and reparation as two forms of commitment for individuals and their families. In addition, a host of rituals and liturgies as well as media outlets like The Messenger and the Sacred Heart radio programs ensured that this devotion remained prominent and accessible to all Catholics. A word here about Jesuits and women. Unlike most religious orders, the Jesuits have no female branch. Nevertheless, the spirituality of the society has attracted and influenced numerous congregations of women, three of whom deserve special mention. One of the first women attracted to Jesuit spirituality was the Englishwoman Mary Ward, 1585 to 1645. She founded two groups based on our constitutions, the Congregation of Jesus and the Loreto Sisters, the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And their charism is the education of women. As Mary Ward was far ahead of her time, she was persecuted by her peers. 
During the French Revolution in 1789, the Jesuit Pierre Clorivier, then in hiding, teamed up with an aristocratic lady, Adelaide Marie de Cisse, to start the Daughters of the Heart of Mary in India known as the Nirmala Sisters. The DHM are active across the world in the professional education of women. Perhaps the women's congregation which approaches closest to Jesuit spirituality is the Religious of the Sacred Heart started in 19th century France by Madeleine Sophie Barat, 1779 to 1865. Another French aristocrat with the help of the Jesuit Joseph Varin. Year two, the education of young women was a priority. What inspired these women to look to the Jesuits? Perhaps the freedom and the intellectualism for which the society has always been noted. Each of these founders was an independent, strong-minded woman, usually of aristocratic background, and dedicated to pioneering work in women's education. Most of these orders arose in 18th and 19th century France during a time of turbulence for the church and society. The point is that the women of today seek a spirituality for their time and their place and ask the society to help them as once it did. Which brings us to our own age. What are the spiritual needs of the church today and how can the society address them? There are three contemporary challenges to Jesuit spirituality. The charismatic renewal, interfaith dialogue, and the new ecological awareness. The charismatic renewal mirrors Pentecostalism, a movement in many Protestant churches with its emphasis on close-knit congregations, spontaneous outpourings of prayer, and public healing. Beginning in the USA during the Vatican Council, the renewal has since become truly international. In essence, a movement of relay renewal, it is characterized by spontaneous prayer, healings of body and spirit, a deep interest in the Bible, and an involvement in outreach ministry. If Vatican II promoted the role of the laity, the charismatic renewal is its most obvious result. The Vatican Council also encouraged a new look at the world religions. It asked Catholics to enter into dialogue with and explore the spiritual riches of Asia. Modern Jesuits like Amaldas, Amaswami and Anthony de Mello have incorporated Eastern spiritual techniques into their ways of prayer. They open new paths and beckon us to follow. Finally, the greatest challenge of all, a new look at the spirituality of creation. Decades ago, the pioneer Teilhard de Jardin invited us to look at the phenomenon of man from a new and evolutionary perspective. Today, climate change compels us to look at the earth with respect and reverence and to learn from the spiritual experiences of the indigenous peoples. The key Jesuit gift is innovation. All through their history, Jesuits have been innovators in mission, in exploration, in intellectual work, in art and media, and in spirituality. In the post-Reformation era, 
their retreats and their catechisms brought about a new understanding of the faith. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the Sacred Heart devotion interpreted the love of God in ways which made sense to the faithful. What new approaches will the Jesuits bring to the Church of the 21st century? What is the kind of spirituality which makes sense to our contemporaries? Will the Jesuits measure up as they have always done? The answer is ours to make.